All right. Um, this is our next topic, and we're going to talk about. <clears throat> sorry, we're going to talk about reflexes, and. I told you before, and I'm going to repeat it on multiple occasions here in AP1, we lay a very important foundation to many things that you will learn in AP2. If you're familiar with, with nerve transmission and neurotransmitters and interaction with the receptor and ionic flow, it's going to be easier in AP2. If you know what reflex arch is, it's going to be easier in AP2. Does that make sense? So we're going to learn what the reflex arch is. Essentially, reflex is unconscious response, motor response, to a certain sensory stimulus. Can you give me the examples of reflexes? Cody already provided one with, you know, pulling the hand from something hot. Something else. Okay, good. When like when so something touches your cornea, you blink immediately. What else? You'll give me somatic responses, somatic reflexes. Can you think about visceral reflexes, reflexes that are dealing with organs? Are you hungry? Okay. If you're hungry now, I, well, some of you, I'm hungry. If somebody brings some food here, what am I going to do? There you go. Is that a reflex? Yes. Does that make sense? So you have, basically, you have sensory input, stimulus, and you have a response. Now, how does it work? Stimulus acts on the receptor. Receptor then transmits the sensory signal through the sensory neuron. Then, it gets into the spinal cord. In some cases, it's a brain stem, but we talk about spinal reflexes now. Spinal cord. And eventually, spinal cord, the function of spinal cord is to integrate this sensory input. And then based on that integration, spinal cord generates the motor response through the motor neuron, and that motor response reaches the effector. Does that make sense? So for instance, when you pull off the arm from something hot, what is your effector or effectors? What are your effectors? Huh? Muscles of what? You pull off the... Well, more general, not only shoulder. Arm, right? Muscles of an arm and the shoulder when you pull it. Make sense? There are two types of reflex arches. Monosynaptic. When you have one synapse between the sensory and the motor neuron. Okay? So you can see here, you have sensory neuron, and it synapses with the motor one. That's monosynaptic, because it has one synapse. Does that make sense? And then you have polysynaptic reflexes, polysynaptic arches. When you have sensory neuron, it synapses with interneuron, which stands for integration. Okay, and then interneuron produces the response to the effector. Does that make sense? Good? Are we fine? Is that understood? Um, do you understand the difference between monosynaptic and polysynaptic? Monosynaptic, one synapse directly between sensory and motor. Polysynaptic, you have interneurons. 
Somatic reflexes control skeletal muscles. Autonomic reflexes control smooth cardiac muscles or glands. So salivation, can you control your salivation? You cannot. That's autonomic reflex. When you go to the doctor and doctor taps on your knee, to check your knee jerk reflex. Can you control it if you really want to? Yes. You can stop your knee from moving. Like you, your example, when you pull your arm away from something hot, if you decide that you want to hurt yourself, can you grab on something hot and hold it? You can. Okay, so you can override the reflex. Does that make sense? Now, to talk about one of the most important somatic reflexes, the stretch reflex, we need, first need to learn about the muscle spindle, spindle and tendon organ. So muscle spindle is the structure shown here that detects and sends the information about changes in the muscle land. Okay? So essentially, it's a stretch. Does that make sense? Good. Then the organ detects changes not only in the stretch but also in the tension of the muscle. And you will see the difference between them. So what anatomically, what does tendon organ consist of? Sorry, what muscle spindle consists of? Here's muscle spindle. It's encapsulated receptor. You can see this purple uh, connective tissue covering, right? And inside of that connective tissue capsule are several muscle fibers. Can you see those muscle fibers? Really thin ones with the blue neurons wrapping them up. Does that make sense? So those muscle fibers inside of the muscle spindle are called intrafusal. Intrafusal inside of that structure. Okay. You can also see that muscle spindle itself is sort of hidden in the skeletal muscle. On this Electron micrograph, you can see the intrafusal fibers, okay? In between the extrafusal ones. Does that make sense? It's sort of, it's sort of a, a fuse, well, you can call it a fuse, hidden inside of the large electrical machine. So muscle spindle is inside of the skeletal muscle. Does that make sense? The fibers of the skeletal muscle itself, the fibers that actually do the work, the fibers that would lift something, that would contract and move things, are called extrafusal. So these fibers outside are extrafusal fibers. Does that make sense? Do you see the difference? between extrafusal fibers and intrafusal ones. Extrafusal fibers comprise the skeletal muscle itself. Intrafusal fibers can be found inside of the muscle spindle. It's a complex structure, muscle spindle. And since it's a receptor, it's a sensory receptor, it must have afferent or sensory innervation, right? So there are two types of afferent fibers. One type is called annular spiral ending. It's a blue, colored blue in this picture. Annular spiral afferent endings are responsible for sensing the rate and degree of stretch. 
So how far the muscle is stretched and how strongly it is stretched. Are we clear? Okay. Flower spray endings, shown in violet, can sense only the degree of stretch. There are two, two types of sensory afferent endings. Does that make sense? Now, skeletal muscle, just general skeletal muscle, does it have any efferent fibers, like motor fibers, coming to it? Sure, yeah, of course. Interestingly enough, the fibers, muscle fibers inside of the spindle also have efferent innervation. You can see this, um, I would say pink probably, dark red fibers here these guys these are called gamma efferent or motor endings they innervate intrafusal fibers extrafusal muscle fibers are innervated by alpha efferent endings so you have alpha for extrafusal and gamma for intrafusal does that make sense? So kind of summarizing this anatomically, you have a capsule inside of the skeletal muscle. In the capsule are several muscle fibers, intrafusal muscle fibers. They have sensory innervation, annular spiral and flower spray endings, and they have motor innervation, gamma efferent fibers. Skeletal muscle itself is innervated by alpha efferent fibers. So, when does the muscle stretch? Let me carry something. And have a way to apply to it. Clear? Does that make sense? Now, let's see how it works. We're going to talk about this. I don't know if we'll have time for the stretch reflex. So, look at the left part of the picture right here. When muscle is relaxed, completely relaxed, and unstretched, afferent fibers generate action potential nevertheless. Does that make sense? It's sort of a basic, le basic level of action potentials. You see the frequency here. Okay, certain frequency. That make sense? When muscle is stretched, those same fibers increase the rate of action potentials. So when the muscle at the, at the basal length, the rate is, I don't know, five potentials a second. When the muscle is stretched, it becomes 10 potentials a second. Does that make sense? Are we clear? Pretty easy, right? Now imagine one thing. Just think about this. I can, I can carry this. The stretch is going to be minimal. Stretch to like upper arm muscles. Now if I will start doing this, then I have like two forces. One force that stretches the muscle because of the weight. And another force, force of contraction. Correct? Let's see what's going to happen to the muscle spindle when muscle contracts. Okay? Look at this part of the picture. I want to warn you, that is hypothetical situation. Think about this. When muscle shortens, what's going to happen to those intrafusal fibers? Uh oh. Oh, they're not going to short. They're not going to become short, right? Just going to like uh, become like moving left and right, completely relaxed. 
I don't have this. I need some sort of... Okay. I'll try very carefully to do this. So imagine the distance between my fingers, you know, between my fingers, is that intrafusal fiber, okay? And the muscle contracts, muscle spindle shortens. An intrafusal fiber will become completely relaxed. It will be just, you know, I forgot the English word, just, just, just going left and right will become slack and, you know, that makes sense. Good. So what's going to happen with action potentials? It will start to produce them. It doesn't have the basal, basic level of stretch. Does that make sense? You see? How it becomes, you know, completely slack. Can you see that? The only way to avoid this is to contract intrafusal fibers together with extrafusal. Does that make sense? Okay. okay. Sure. So on the left, here, extrafusal fibers, the actual muscle contracts. When it contracts, it shortens. Does that make sense? So, muscle spindle also shortens. When it shortens, intrafusal fibers should become completely slack. This is what can hypothetically happen, but, here comes the word but, when extrafusal fibers contract, intrafusal fibers contract as well. Does that make sense? So, muscle shortens, and the fibers inside of the spindle shorten too. So, there is no change in the tension applied to annular spiral endings. And even shortened muscle spindle keeps producing basal rate of action potential. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? You got it? Second pic this pic this picture is what actually happens. That's what actually happens. This what could happen, but This actually happens. Does that make sense? So the, the, the rightmost picture is what actually happens. Now this process, this phenomenon, when extrafusal fibers and intrafusal fibers contract at the same time is called Alpha gamma coactivation. Remember which fibers, efferent motor fibers, innervate extrafusal muscle? How do we call them? Which efferent fibers innervate extrafusal? Alpha, intrafusal, gamma. Both those efferent fibers, alpha and gamma, transmit motor output at the same time. So intrafusal fibers and extrafusal fibers are activated at the same time through gamma and alpha efferent endings. That's why we call this phenomenon alpha-gamma coactivation. It must happen to maintain the basal level of stretch in the muscle spindle. Does that make sense? I'm going to ask you about this, about alpha-gamma coactivation, I promise. It's going to be on the exam. Okay, we're good? Any questions? 
Okay.